or welcome to this video titled Unlocking a Freemason's Heart. The reason for this title is that the subject of this video focuses on the notion of Masonic keys. And the reason why I'm talking about Masonic keys is because I stumbled upon that notion when reading the first section of the first lecture. Now, if, if anyone watching this video is not aware of the lectures, and I wouldn't judge you for not being aware of the lectures, I wouldn't judge anyone, but it's no, it would be no surprise to me. Many Masons I've talked to over the years, especially junior Masons, would be unaware of the lecture series if they have not been referred to them. The lectures are in three volumes, three lectures essentially, and each lecture has a number of sections. The first lecture has seven sections, the second lecture has five sections, and the third lecture has three sections. And any Masonic seeker aware of that number sequence will be able to relate the seven, five, and three to Masonry. So it's no coincidence that they have those particular number of sections. It's in relation to the first section of the first lecture where I found the notion of Masonic keys. And in doing so, while I was reading this passage, I also, and I would say possibly coincidentally, although I don't really believe in them, I found a paragraph in Walter Leslie Wilmshurst's the Masonic Initiation. The first book he wrote was called Contemplations, and I believe that was uh, talking about the interpretation of biblical scripture. The second book, which is his most famous, is The Meaning of Masonry, which I would imagine many watching this video would be aware of already. And he wrote a sequel to The Meaning of Masonry called The Masonic Initiation, which was designed for the more advanced of Masonic seekers. Well, it's in the Masonic initiation that I found reference to this very passage. So, first of all, I'm going to just read out Wilmshurst's passage for you, and I'll show it on the screen for you so you can see it. And it reads as follows. Does that key hang or lie? asks one of our lectures. For most Masons, it lies. It lies rusting and unused because they either do not desire or do not know how to use it or have no one competent to show them how to do so. For some few it hangs, you are taught where, and though it is of no manner of metal, those who have found and use it pursuing their quest with fervency and zeal, if perhaps at first with shambling feet and uncertain steps, may assuredly hope to gain admission into the lodge of their own soul, and, when the last hoodwink falls, that now blinds their vision, to find themselves there face to face with the master of that lodge, and in possession of every point of fellowship with him. So, before I explain about this passage and how I think Wilmshurst has seen this, I think I'm just going to set out by way of introduction before I introduce you to the lecture, a bit of a background as to how I see the three main principal officers who rule a lodge. The three officers who rule a lodge are the worshipful master, the senior warden and the junior warden. Now, these officers are given symbols attached to their collars. The Worshipful Master has the square and it's portrayed on the Master's collar as a square with the base turned downwards, so with the point turned up. The Senior Warden has the level and the Junior Warden has the plum or commonly known as the plum rule. It's the wardens that I'm going to refer to specifically in relation to this very passage I'll read out with the ritual. And the reason is because it's those symbols which have a lot of meaning. The 
Junior Warden's symbol being the plum or plum rule denotes the vertical, the vertical axis. And the senior warden, who has the level, denotes the horizontal axis. Now, one can go further and see what else it represents. The junior warden's plum also represents something that's upright, like the intellect. That's been designated the uprightness of this symbol. The level of the senior warden can be likened to the heart. So in a the progression of a mason's journey, he moves from the junior warden to the senior warden. That's the natural progression. And the notion of the master with the square, the senior warden with the level, and the junior warden with the plum is to show that from the square came the level and the plum. Or in other words, the square being composed of a vertical and a horizontal axis combined gave rise to a separation, a segregation. So from the square came the level at the senior ward, and from there came the plum. So this is a, the notion of the Masonic journey is to go from the outside aspect at the junior warden to something that's deeper, such as the senior warden. These three who rule a lodge signify the threefold nature of being. So if you would look at the junior warden at the lowest level of that trinity, he represents that which is more outward facing, that which is lower. You could either call it the root chakra or something designated with the material. Or for those in a more Masonic context, you could say the outside of the lodge or that which is more outward facing. So that could be encompassing the physical body. It could encompass the lower mind. I refer to it as the lower mind. Or you could simply refer to it as the thinking mind, that intellectual aspect of oneself. The senior warden represents the heart level, or you could say the higher mind, that which is slightly higher than the junior warden, or otherwise referred to, or commonly referred to, as the soul. The worshipful master represents that divine spark, or God within. So you have that trinity, and the notion of masonry is that one is truly viewing reality from the worshipful master's perspective, but is trapped at the junior warden and doesn't realize it until the end of that journey. So at the beginning of every mason's journey, he starts from the outside and moves gradually towards the inner and then to the innermost at the worshipful master. So with that in mind, one moves from the intellect at the junior warden's pedestal to the heart at the senior warden's pedestal. So keep that in mind, and I'm now going to show you the passage in the first section of the first lecture. As you can see on the screen, the first question in this series of questions and answers. I appreciate that the first section is a lot bigger than what I'm showing you on the screen, but it's specifically in relation to the Masonic key that this that these um, questions have relevance. So the first question, as I've shown you, says, have Mason secrets? They have many invaluable ones. Where do they keep them? In their hearts. To whom do they reveal them? None but brothers and Freemasons. How do they reveal them? By signs, tokens and particular words. As Masons, how do we hope to get at them? By the help of a key. Does that key hang or lie? It hangs. Why is the preference given to hanging? It should always hang in a brother's defence and never lie to his prejudice. 
What does it hang by? The thread of life in the passage of utterance. Why is it so nearly connected with the heart? Being an index of the mind, it should utter nothing but what the heart truly dictates. It is a curious key. Of what metal is it composed? No metal, it is the tongue of good report. And at the end of this lecture, there is the charge that says, that excellent key, a Freemason's tongue, which should speak well of a brother absent or present, but when unfortunately that cannot be done with honour and propriety, should adopt that excellent virtue of the craft, which is silence. So let's just look very briefly back to Wilmshurst's passage. Again, he's, let's have a look at this. He says, does that key hang or lie? Asks one of our lecturers. For most Masons, it lies. It lies rusting and unused because they either do not desire or do not know how to use it or have no one competent to show them how to do so. For some few it hangs you are taught where, and though it is of no manner of metal, those who have found and use it, pursuing their quest with fervency and zeal, if perhaps at first with shambling feet and uncertain steps, etc., etc. The important part here that I think the takeaway for me was he refers to it as lying, rusting and unused. In other words, the notion of a key lying is seen by Wilmshurst in the in the pejorative, in the negative. And so looking back at the lecture, that's certainly how one would assume that the lecture is getting at. So the lecture seems to show that preference is given to hanging, which one might assume that the lecture is suggesting that we are to move something from the level to the perpendicular. But as I explained before in my precy of masonry in the first degree or any degree, moving from the junior warden to the senior warden is that natural spiritual progression. So you're moving from an upright to a level. So I don't think that passage within this um, lecture is suggesting that we ought to give preference to the upright. I think it's suggesting that the natural preference of a human being is to the intellect rather than that which is deeper, which is the heart. And then the next line, when it says it should always hang in a brother's defence, well, that's how one would normally find it, hanging in a brother's defence. Or in other words, one would naturally move towards that intellect position in defence of his sense of personal self, because it would lie to his prejudice. If he was moving from that heart perspective, he would lose the notion of personhood, or at the very sense, or at the very, or at the very least, he would lose the notion of that uniqueness that he ascribes to that egoic notion of personhood. So we we should have it lying to one's personal prejudice. But like everything in masonry, the way words are phrased, it's to allow us to initially jump to a conclusion. But then let's then go back at it and then question what that real meaning might be. Then goes on to say, what does it hang by? The thread of life in the passage of utterance. Why is it so nearly connected with the heart? Being an index of the mind, it should utter nothing but what the heart truly dictates. Well, I'm just going to give you a very brief interpretation, which bit of a tangent, but it could relate to this as well. There's a, there's a lot of mention here about utterance, speaking, silence, tongue. All of that, in my view, relates to vibration, to resonance, and especially the word. Now, I think one way of looking at this could be key could relate to a note as in getting oneself, one's soul, or one's essence, one's being, in tune with a higher vibration. 
So you can do that with the help of a key, a particular resonance. And it's at that resonance, which is at that heart level, which is where you can unlock the secrets of masonry. So that's one way of looking at it. And it's I think it's quite a beautiful way of looking at that. But the the actual interpretation that really struck a chord with me, to pardon the pun, is as follows. So let's go back to the beginning. Have Mason's secrets. They have many invaluable ones. Now, let's just pause there. The word invaluable is curious here because information, if a secret is something that one should find by way of information, then that has value. Have we not seen many films where a police officer is questioning a potential witness or trying to get information from a witness, I should say, and the witness extorts that situation by demanding payment for that information? In other words, cough it up and I'll give you what you need. Well, that's not in relation to this. It can't be information that has value. It has to be something that's invaluable, something that is beyond value, something that's beyond the material, beyond metal. So I think that's a very important message there. It says then, where do they keep them in their hearts? Just like we mentioned in earlier in an earlier video, that especially in the solemn obligation, it's about moving from the heart, not from the mind. If we go down further, um, let's go to. As Masons, how do we hope to get at them? By the help of a key. Does that key hang or lie? It hangs. Why is the preference given to hanging? Should always hang in a brother's defence and never lie to his prejudice. Okay. So by the help of a key. What does a key normally open? It should open a door. And let's think about this logically. A key hanging cannot open a lock to a door. It must be lying so that it can open that lock. So in other words, the use of the intellect to decipher the secrets of masonry would get you nowhere. You will not be open, you're not you will not be able to open that door. Only by using the heart first can you then unlock the door to a a, a new realm of interpretation? Now, I mentioned before it says, why is the preference given to hanging? I think, again, the natural egoic notion is that one gives preference to the intellect over the heart. We see in the first degree in masonry the step and sign. Well, with the step, we always step off with the left foot. Now, the notion of left relates to the heart. The notion of right denotes the mind. So if we're stepping off with the left foot and placing the right heel in the left hollow, that to me signifies that we first of all have to move from the heart and then get the mind in line with the resonance of the heart. And that message is again reiterated by why is it so nearly connected with the heart? Being an index of the mind, it should utter nothing but what but what the heart truly dictates. So that's the message, but put in a very poetic way. So I think essentially that's what it's getting at. It's essentially saying in this piece of ritual or this lecture that one must initially step off with the heart. Imagine, but in a practical sense, in a very real sense, imagine your interactions with every walk of life, or it's at least with every person that you meet. Imagine that you move from the heart first rather than from the mind. Most people move from the mind first and we engage the conditioning aspect of ourselves. We, we, we give judgments. We pass judgment on the individual that we are meeting. Do they look right? What do they look like? What are they saying? Where are they from? What job do they have? What's their name? What, what background are they from? Etc. Etc. 
if you're moving from the heart, you don't see those differences. First of all, what you do is you embrace the essence of that which you are engaging with and you see that you are one and the same. So in essence, for me, that's the message of this piece of ritual. It's about engaging the heart first and getting the intellect or the mind thereafter in line with the heart. And if you can't yet do that, then it says you must adopt the excellent virtue of the craft, which is silence. And there's a, there's a lot of secret um, wisdom within that notion, silence. There's a, a wealth, spiritual wealth within the notion of silence itself. So thank you for indulging me with this video. Um, I hope you found it interesting. There's It's jam-packed full of interpretation, as you can see. There may be deeper ways of looking at it. I don't think Wilmshurst quite saw the depth in this piece of ritual, unlike in other pieces of ritual that he's seen depth in. He may very well have seen deeper than how he's expressed in the book, but he just hasn't expressed it there. But either way, I hope this has given you a good um, introduction and a, a good uh, example of how to interpret in an esoteric way pieces of Masonic ritual. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please like the like button. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already done so. And please ding the bell for any notifications of any new videos. Thank you.